Greetings, I welcome you to our worship service here at Bethel United Church of Christ in Evansville, Indiana. I'm Reverend Samuel Buer, and I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, here in this place where we strive to be united in seeking God's will and also in serving all people. So we welcome those who are joining us in person and as well as those uh, out online. Uh, we sent out a notice to, to those that we could earlier or towards the end of this week about where we're at with COVID, where we think we're at here in this place. Um, when we required masks back in the first part of January, uh, if you say that was 100% of where we were uh, as of last week, we are about 6% of, of that level. And so in a much safer place now. Uh, and so we are encouraging folks that if you, uh, if you still feel most comfortable wearing a mask, please feel free to do so, but we're no longer requiring it here in this place with one exception. And that's when, when with working with our preschool, since there's so many of the children back there uh, who cannot yet uh, be vaccinated. Some other announcements regarding our missions. Um, one of our families here, uh, uh, Nanning and, and her husband Elmer, are uh, mission, have have been uh, have been worship leaders, uh, clergy in the United Church of Christ of the Philippines, and the area where they had served was hit real uh, uh, badly by a typhoon, and many homes and, and even churches were destroyed. And so when they were here a month or more ago, back in January, they said, we're gonna try to raise $1,000 per family and they would like to raise enough for a hundred families to help rebuild their homes. And so we set a goal at that time of not only one, but we're now we're on the way to, for, to, to supplying two, two homes. Our mission team said for every dollar donated, we will match that dollar. And by doing so, we're now somewhere over $1,300 have been raised towards that. And so many thanks and we encourage you, if you wanna make a contribution, just mark it Philippines and we'll know um, how to where, where it needs to go. Uh, we're looking for volunteers for Habitat and also if you haven't signed the two by fours out there, those will be a part of the home that's, that is under construction in March for the United Church of Christ and the Disciples of, uh, uh, Disciples of Christ Church of the build that we do with Habitat. I can invite Stephanie if you'd want to come forward and share about our mission for the month about Eden Theological Seminary. Thank you, Sam. It's good to see so many visitors today, too. Oh, it's good. Thanks so much. It's been said that the church exists for mission as fire exists for burning. So I am so proud. I know I join you in that. They say pride goes before the fall, but proud of... of uh, Bethel's mission project. Some of you all have seen the headlines in the Courier, I'm going off script, about the crisis center. And we've been working at that at United Caring Services for about five years. We've got the center ready, but we don't have the operating funds. Hopefully, the city council will pass $300,000 tomorrow night, thanks to Mayor Winnicke's uh, emphasis. Uh, we need more than that for a four-day or seven-day mission. So if you haven't seen the article, please uh, see it and say a prayer. But Sam has offered me the opportunity to talk about Eden, which is close to my heart, and I know to yours. If you have found any help in the work of the Niebuhrs, both Reinhold and H. Richard, or in the work of Walter Brueggemann, my Old Testament prof, if you've been touched by the ministry of Reuben Bierbaum or Joe Fricaro, then you are indebted to Eden as I am. A theology prof and an astronomer, that was one of Joe's big high things, were talking in the plane. They really decided to go ahead and spend some of their time talking. And so they started with the church. They started with systematic theology and Old Testament and New Testament and all of that. And finally, the astronomer said, well, I guess it all boils down to the golden rule. So then they moved to talk about astronomy. They talked about astro expulsions and black holes and dwarf stars and all that kind of stuff. And then the minister said, well, I guess it all boils down to twinkle, twinkle, little star. Theology is much more than the golden rule, though it is that. And astronomy is much more than twinkle, twinkle, little star, though it is that. Theology um, binds together psychology, that's how we deal with ourselves, and sociology, how we deal with each other, and ecology, how we deal with the world, and all that gets bound up in 
theology, which is the study of the more. That's one of my uh, titles for God. God is more than we can imagine. And when we study theology, either as clergy or as lay people, as we read books like Amy Jill Devine's book, we are trying to deal with both psychology and sociology and ecology and God, even as God deals with us. So I am so proud that Eden, there are lots of good seminaries, we love United, but Eden is the seminary for our catchment area. And as much as I love to talk about its history, I'm more excited about its future. And I thank Bethel for being a part of that future never deal with shoulds in the church, but could Eden always be in our outreach budget? And could Eden be a part of your thinking as you decide to deal with all that God has given you? And maybe even name somebody else to go into seminary. I'm retired. Sam's not going to go forever, <laughs> though we hope, a long time. We need more clergy. We need more support. Bethel exists for mission. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. She did a little uh, uh, aside to United, the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. That's where I received my degree. I looked at Eden and I looked at United and I kind of flipped the coin and I said, I like winter and St. Louis doesn't have winter. So otherwise I, that's where I ended up up there. I want to draw your attention to uh, uh, when we were talking about prayer for Ukraine. So I want to draw attention to to this over here. Uh, this statue, uh, this wood carving, if you will, I picked that up about 20 years ago. I was on a medical mission uh, trip with the Ohio Conference United Church of Christ to the very western part of Ukraine. Uh, and my dad was a wood carver, and we happened to be, as a part of the travels there, in addition to, to visiting the hospitals, we were meeting with some politicians, and we met with what would amount to the, the governor of the state of Indiana, but it was this part, there was that part of, of uh, of Ukraine. And this was in the state house. And there were some wood carvings there and some other things that, that folks had made from their area. And they said, this is probably the best wood carver in the country of Ukraine at that time. And so I picked it up, um, not thinking I would ever use it in this way. I, it was a gift for my, for my father and my mother, because what do you get 70s and 80 year olds for Christmas anymore? But my dad was a wood carver. So I thought, I'll get him this wood carver. I paid $187.50 for it. I saw the note just the other day. Um, I don't speak German, or I, don't sp I speak German, but I don't speak the Russian language which was used in that, lo that location. And so the doctor that was assisting me with that purchase uh, did all the, you know, all the things that needed to be done for that transaction. And then I learned the next day, and this was one of the top doctors in that area as a pediatrician. His salary for the year was $600. I just spent a third of his salary on a wood carving. I was embarrassed. But that's how the, how the need is so great in that area. Uh, I thought I would bring it today because as a tie-in to Ukraine, I know it's on many of our thoughts as to what's going on in that neck of the woods. Uh, not only did I have that tie to Ukraine, but uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Wilhelm Klunt, uh, and his wife, Elizabeth, emigrated from what would be the area of Odessa in the southern part of Ukraine. And so some distant relatives yet there that we we've lost track of, uh, but my heart aches for what's happening with the people there. I cannot imagine what they're going through. don't want to imagine it for anybody. So I thought, while it's here and, and you can, you know, during our, during our time of worship, during our time of prayer, you know, you might want to focus on that. So let us worship this day. In fact, I should have drawn and said a little bit more about that. If you, if you, I don't know if you're looking real close, but it's Mother Mary holding in, in, the, in the Orthodox tradition, which would be Jesus more in an adult form, not so much an infant form with a sign of peace in his hands with two angels then kind of supporting them. And so... Please join me now with a call to worship. 
Beyond our busyness and above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising born of heaven and reaching out to each one of us. A light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all of who we are, a light that transfigures the world, that transforms darkness into hope, that brings life from a cross where old life ends and new life is born. In glory, Jesus meets us here, raising us from the depths of valley to the height of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. So let us worship from the mountain and hear again, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. Let us sing. I invite those who are able to rise as we sing. Please join me in the opening prayer. Mother in God, we confess that we often wish to spend all of our time with you on the mountaintop where we are sure of your presence, where we feel connected to you. We confess that when we come down from the mountain, we often fail to go back into the world to be your hands and feet. We struggle to see you in the faces of our neighbor and we are overwhelmed by the brokenness we see in the world. Forgive us, O oh God, when our vision is limited and our actions do not live out our discipleship. Amen. Children of God, we are forgiven. As a mother nurtures and holds her babies, keeping them ever so close, so God does too. God, we trust that you will all to inspire us and stay with us on the mountain and through the valleys. Please be seated. I'd like to invite Cynthia for the children's message. Good morning. Do any of you like to travel? Even if you can't go anywhere, you can read books about places that you would like to visit, or you can ask your parents if you want to search the internet for the most amazing places on earth. So I did that, and I'm going to show you just a few. Isn't that beautiful? Is, uh, yeah, probably is. Here, is that better? Pretty, pretty mountain with some blossoms. Great big waterfall. A lot bigger than Niagara Falls. I 
don't know if you can see it from there, but within those mountains, there's a civilization that has built buildings. And that one went away. There it is. This is Machu Picchu in Peru. So sightseeing through pictures is kind of like being there. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, come follow me. Can you imagine what it was like for them to travel with Jesus? Just think of the sights that they saw. They saw water turned into wine. They saw blind, crippled, and sick people healed. They saw people raised from the dead. They saw Jesus walk on the water. They saw 5,000 people fed with five loaves and two fish. Every day with Jesus was an exciting experience as the disciples followed him. Our Bible lesson today tells about a trip up a mountain that proved to be one of the most exciting journeys ever for, Jesus's, for three of Jesus' disciples. The Bible tells us that Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As Jesus was praying, his face was changed and his clothes became a dazzling white. Suddenly, two Bible heroes appeared and began talking to Jesus. It was Moses and Elijah. Peter and the others had fallen asleep, and when they woke up, they saw Jesus and the other two talking. What a glorious sight. As Moses and Elijah started to leave, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's build three shelters, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. Suddenly a cloud appeared and covered them. A voice from the cloud said, this is my son, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Moses and Elijah were gone and the disciples were once again alone with Jesus on the mountaintop. What a sight to see. No wonder Peter wanted to stay on the mountaintop. But the Bible tells us that Peter didn't know what he was saying. After all, if he had stayed there, they would have missed all the wonderful travels and experiences that followed. You will have many wonderful experiences if you choose to follow Jesus. When we have a great mountaintop experience, we may wish that it would never end, but what God said from the cloud reminds us it's not just seeing great sights in your faith journey, it's about listening to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the wonderful experiences we enjoy. As we walk each day with Jesus, help us to listen to what he is teaching us. Through your word, the Bible. Help us to follow him wherever he leads us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Cynthia. And as he's Sharon getting up, and I invite any of the children that would like to join uh, Sharon and the crew in, in our chapel area for a children's church. You've been hearing a lot in the, in the uh, bulletin so far in, in terms of liturgy about mountains and mountaintops and, and light and such. Uh, I thought I would do a real quick uh, kind of a history lesson of the church year. The church year begins in Advent, uh, those four Sundays of Advent that lead into that Christmas where we celebrate Christ's birth. So that Advent is a time of preparation for that, for that period. And then that Christmas season lasts all of 12 days. And when that season is over, we enter the season of Epiphany. And we're in that season right now. And Epiphany is a season of light, if you will, or, or epiphanies where our eyes are opened to seeing in new ways or, or into listening in new ways. And today marks the end of that Epiphany season. And the, end, the last Sunday in Epiphany is always, the, the readings are always have to do with what we call the transfiguration of Jesus on that mountaintop. And Cynthia already gave you a little heads up on that. 
Um, you know, Easter is coming, and one of the fun parts of, of teaching confirmation, and sometimes I suspect you probably have not forgotten, but I'll help remind you in case it's a little bit rusty. Um, Easter sets, the, we set the year by Christmas, December 25th, and then Easter sets the other calendar as to how we determine how long Epiphany season is. Epi uh, Easter is set by, it's the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. So if you keep, if you, if you figure out when the spring equinox is, then look at where is that first full moon after that. And this time that first full moon is rather late after that. And so we have a very late Easter uh, this year. But thought you just might, that's always a little fun little tidbit in the church. Here are now the readings that have to do with the transfiguration. You're going to hear of a transfiguration of Moses uh, through the book of Exodus and also the one of Jesus as we read it, in, as we come to it in the book of Luke. From Exodus 34, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses and the, the skin of his face was shining, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see that the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with God. Hear now also this lesson from the Gospel of Luke. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and they went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes <clears throat> became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him, and they appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. <clears throat> when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. The word of God this day for the people of God. Thanks be to God Almighty. Amen. Could you get a bottle of water from the kitchen back there? Appreciate it. <coughs> Let us bow our heads for a moment for prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Mark Twain once said, you cannot depend upon your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. Now let me say that again. You cannot depend upon your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. So that quote got me wondering, what is it that we cannot see because we do not have eyes 
to see or the imagination that can focus in on it. It reminds me of a story that I once heard longer ago of a preacher in a country church who in a sermon told how he was called out, called into ministry. He'd been a farmer, and one day while he was plowing the fields, he was looking up at the beauty of, of the, his surroundings, and he was looking, and looking at the sky, and he saw a cloud formation that was strangely in, in the letters P.C., and he interpreted that was God speaking to him to preach Christ, because he had been doing some discerning. And he shared that in the service that day. And one of the old time farmers caught him up afterwards and said, I think you misinterpreted it. It meant plant corn. <laughs> I share that because not, and I won't even say oddly, because it happens often that on any given Sunday, there'll be someone that might catch me. This happened a number of times over the years where one person will, as they leave, will say, that sermon really hit me. You really spoke to what I needed. And then oftentimes later in the week, I might hear from another one through a roundabout, because they would never tell me this directly, that that was a lousy sermon. What I learned over time was, it may have been a lousy sermon, because some are, but always God is at work if one has the imagination to focus in on it. And even lousy sermons become good sermons when one has the imagination to see what God is about doing. The Reverend Nancy Wright, in a sermon some time ago, was telling a story of an airplane flight of a woman and her grandson. It was her grandson's first flight. And as the plane flew higher and higher, as it, when it got above the clouds, and can you remember one of your first flights when you finally get above the clouds? You've never seen that before. And how glorious that is. And the boy saw that for the first time and turned to his grandma and said, Grandma, now are we with God? Naively, that boy was asking, truly asking, are we with God? Sadly, he had not been taught yet or didn't have the right teacher to inform him that we're always with God. always with God or God is with us or within us if we had the imagination to focus in on it. Unfortunately, most of us, probably all of us at some point or most times in our lives don't have that imagination to focus in on us. The Christian mystics often talk about our being asleep and unaware of the workings of God around us. The mystics challenge us to wake up to what is real. Now think of the text that we just read from the gospel reading about the disciples. It said they were tired. They were sleepy. They were asleep to what was going on around them. The mystics would say that's when Jesus steps in and invites them to wake up from their slumber, as I am doing now in this sermon with you, inviting all of us to wake up from our slumber that we might see God. We might have that epiphany. There's another story of an older man who longed to hear God speaking to him. And his prayer, a constant prayer was, God, speak to me. And when he prayed that one day, a metal lark sang. But he didn't hear it. So the man yelled out louder, God, speak to me. 
and thunder rolled across the sky, but he didn't listen to it. God, speak to me, he said, and a star shone brightly, but he noticed it not. And the man said, God, show me a miracle. And a life was born, but he was unaware of it. So he cried out in despair, touch me, God, touch me. Let me know that you are here. Whereupon God reached down and touched the man. And the man brushed the butterfly off and walked on. What was that quote I began with? You cannot depend upon your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. I suspect the mystics are right. We are asleep much of our time. And we need to wake up to what is real. When Peter arises from his slumber, thinking about what he's seen and about what's taking place. He says, Master, it's been good that we are here. We need to make, I'd like to make us have made three dwellings, really three altars to remember this time, to remember you and Moses and Elijah. And it's at that point that God breaks in with the word that Peter needed to hear. This is my beloved, would you listen to him? I imagine that really came with a clap of thunder. Listen to him, wouldn't you? You haven't been yet. It makes me wonder in my own life how many times I missed those statements when God sang that to me. Some years ago, I had the fortunate uh, to be in the presence of a fellow by the name of Alan Jones, who had written a book called Soul Making. And Alan Jones was a great speaker of faith. In that book, Soul Making, he wrote, occasionally the fog lifts. Occasionally the fog lifts and we catch a glimpse of what we really are. Things as they really are. And then the fog creeps over us again. The fog keeps us humble, compassionate, and the flashes of light keep us hopeful and exhilarated. It is my humble prayer this day as we near this end of this epiphany season, as we prepare for the Lenten journey ahead, that we can be aware and see the fog lifting, and that we get a, a glimpse and catch a glimpse of the light that is before us. I suspect I've told you this other story before, but I share it again because I think it's fitting right now. There was one time in my life I was on, was, I had an early morning meeting, and it was a 45-minute drive, and when I woke up that morning, it was a dense fog. It was that white knuckle driving kind of a fog. And I knew that my 45 minute drive was now going to be an hour and 15 or more. Praying that the fog would lift along that journey. As I got 15 minutes into that drive, about 10 miles in, inching along the road, praying no cars on the road with me, I saw off to, the, off to my one side a, a pillar of real white, what looked like smoke. And I thought, there's a farmer out here like my dad who burns stuff when it's foggy so no one knows you're burning. But then I saw it again about a half mile later. I thought, well, it can't be a fire. It's something else. So I kept watching it and I realized it's moving with me. And I watched that for five miles, and then I saw it, for I had the imagination now to see it. 
The fog was only about 100 feet thick. I could see above me. I couldn't see in front of me, but I could see above me. I could see clear sky. And that's when I saw the rainbow, whose foot I had been watching in all that time. And that foot, all those colors became the brightest white you can imagine. If we have eyes to see, we can see what God is about and what a glorious life this is. For God is with us. Amen. I invite you to turn now to the, page seven, O Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair, as we sing. And I invite those who are able to stand as we sing. Let us continue with the pastoral prayer. God of glory, you took your friends with you. When you went to pray on the mountain, you revealed to them the glory of Jesus, your beloved son, on his way to the cross. But we too would glimpse your glory in the ordinary days of our lives and in the community of your son in which you have chosen to dwell. We look for you among people who have no power, no rights, no voice. We look for you among those who live on the streets of our city, whose housing is inadequate, whose homes are not safe. We look for you among those who grieve a past that is no more and fear a future that seems full of loss. God who meets us in the broken places Shine the light of Christ deep into our lives so we may carry that light into dark places and point to the one whose brokenness is our salvation. Let's now be in a time of silence as we remember those many names that we, for which we shared before we began the service. Let us also remember the people of Ukraine now in this time. Let's be in silence. Thank you. 
to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. I invite now those who are able to rise as we sing this final song. We have come at Christ's own bidding. Let's join now in one voice as we dedicate the gifts of our time and our talents, our treasures, to the great work of which God is about and we join in with God. Please join with me. We glorify you, O oh God, through these gifts in our lives. May they be used to reveal your glory in ways which proclaim Jesus as your chosen and beloved Son and which show that we have indeed listened to him. Amen. As this service now comes to close, hear these words. In the coming week, may you experience the presence of God with joy. May the holy cloud comfort you, and may the divine voice encourage you. And may the power of the Spirit transform you, transform us, and transform the world. Amen. This service has ended. Your service now begins. Go knowing that the Spirit of God is upon you. Amen. Amen.